So, welcome, welcome everyone. <laughs> um, my name is Dr. Sam Hurst. Um, that's my Twitter handle at Rob Goth Sam, and you can also use the hashtag Romancing the Gothic if you'd like to live tweet or comment on the class at all, or to contact me after the event or find each other. Um, so today I'm doing the second in two days of the talks on demonic representation. Now you don't need to have come to yesterday's class to come and appreciate this one. I will be making some references back to yesterday's class, but any sort of relevant information that's necessary, I will be uh, putting it in. So um, yesterday we looked at sexy Satan and particularly the sort of uh, Satan in the cultural imaginary of sort of the Anglophone West. Um, and today we're looking at a slightly different tradition. We're looking um, very specifically at the devil as the devil appears in the Scottish Gothic. Now, I'm going to just emphasize here that I'm looking at the Scottish Gothic. So although I'll be making some reference to folkloric traditions, this isn't an in-depth exploration of the folklore per se. There'll be overlap, but instead I'm looking at how the demonic appears in the cultural imaginary of Scotland, um, specifically as it manifests in literature. Um, and you'll note that the title is no more, nothing about sexy Satans. This time it's about the devil or the devil. And we'll return to that as sort of a key trope of demonic depiction in the Scottish Gothic. So um, just to get us started, let me make uh, sort of these ties with the talk that we did yesterday, thinking about the Scottish Gothic tradition of demonic depiction as different from sort of uh, the arc of demonic tradition that we looked at yesterday. So yesterday, what we looked at was this sort of move from the medieval, almost bestial depictions of uh, Satan with the face butt and the horns um, towards, uh, through that rereading and reimagining of the satanic through uh, Milton's Paradise Lost particularly, and through that romantic rereading in the 18th and early 19th centuries, to the proliferation of different satanic kind of um, depictions that we get today and the sort of really broad register of ways in which uh, satanic imagery and demonic imagery is used, both kind of referring back sometimes to a more traditional, as it were, conception of the devil as evil, um, or this rereading of the satanic figure as a freedom-oriented uh, rebel who uh, sort of challenges or breaks or fractures kind of hegemonic narratives. Um, so that's the sort of arc of demonic tradition uh, that we looked at. And, and it's worth sort of thinking just very briefly about that, how that manifests in the Anglophone Gothic in um, England and Ireland, particularly um, at the same period that we're going to be starting our look at Scottish Gothic today. Um, so it emerges, the devil emerges in this English and Irish Gothic um, through this sort of narrative of the special case Faustian Pact, which really is what it says on the tin, a Faustian Pact to deal with the devil, which applies to a special case. The devil is targeting specific people for specific reasons. There are three examples of this that I can use really briefly to illustrate. One of them is French, which you might notice, The Devil in Love by Jacques Cathot, who's a man who learns specifically arcane rituals in order to uh, commune with the devil, get extra powers, etc. And he ends up with a devilish companion. Um, and the idea is that the sort of action that will tip him over into damnation is if he sleeps with this demonic figure. Um, the Monk by Matthew Lewis has the Monk Ambrosia, you can see the picture on the right, who um, is tempted by a demonic force and eventually signs over his soul in blood on a script in order to attain sort of temporary liberation from the Inquisition. He doesn't look at the terms and conditions well enough, so he gets out of the Inquisition and then the devil throws him off a mountain. Um, and Melmoth the Wanderer um, is an interesting one, and I've picked it because Melmoth himself isn't a devil. He's fulfilling a sort of demonic function, going around, tempting people, asking them to sign over their souls. But he's asking people to basically take over the deal that he made with the devil. So there's an interesting blurring of demonic and human there. And the blurring of demonic and human is something I'm going to talk about a lot in relation to the Scottish Gothic. And I want to make a distinction here between the Scottish Gothic that we're going to look at and what's going on with Maturin. Because in Maturin, this uh, sort of blurring of the human and demonic isn't about the idea that the human has something of the demonic in it generally. This is about a human who has become demonic through his own actions and has come to sort of, has degenerated to the point of fulfilling a demonic function. 
Um, so I've said that there's a special case issue going on here, and so you can't see the full quote, but, and I've used the example of the monk here. So why was the monk targeted by Satan? Well, he um, is targeted because of his position, renowned throughout Spain as a man of holiness, but he's also targeted because of his own internal situation, the fact um, that he believes himself superior to the rest of fellow creatures with no stain upon his conscience, so he believes himself to be perfect, he's um, he has some demonic pride going on. And also the fact that he has the capacity for a greater evil than almost anybody else. For hell boasts no miscreant more guilty than you. So the sheer scale of his iniquity and the evils of pride are what draw the devil's attention to him. And what you find in this tradition of special case Faustian Pax is that the people who are being tempted are people who are sort of already um, bad the devil is being used almost or using himself as a way of punishing these uh, characters, drawing them deeper and deeper and deeper into iniquity and punishing them, which is not what we're going to be seeing necessarily in the Scottish Gothic. So I'll return to that in a second. There's also some other features of this uh, tradition um, that the devil must be summoned, usually using uh, specific rites or specific requests. Um, there is always a moment in which the soul is signed away or lost, which usually is part of a deal or a pact. Um, and that's sort of something, again, that we're not going to see in the same way in the Scottish Gothic. There's also this conception of the devil having a distinctive appearance, which will be ultimately revealed. So there's an authentic appearance. So in the monk, we looked at it yesterday. He appears originally as an angel of light and very naked and very beautiful. And then later at the end of the novel, he appears in a sort of much more ugly and hideous, yet still sublime, but his true form, as it were. Um, and as I sort of noticed yesterday, all of these features of this Anglophone tradition, which is the tradition that's probably uh, most prominent in inf informing our cultural imaginary around the devil, um, just as, you know, just as we're thinking about sort of uh, British or American, for example, uh, popular productions. Um, this, this tradition is one which doesn't really have that much of a biblical precedent. What you have or what you find is in sort of literary narratives or church traditions building one on top of another until you come to this sort of conception of the devil, which has very little to do with how the devil appears or how the devil functions in the Bible. So, Having looked at that tradition, have that in mind as something which is a constructed tradition, which the Scottish Gothic is not a part of. Um, so in Scottish diablerie and the Scottish sort of traditions of uh, demonology and of demonic depiction, we have a return to a sort of more biblical conception of the demonic. Um, and this is in part really inflected by the religious history of Scotland and particularly the impact of the 1560 Reformation. So what you have um, in the Reformation period in England and then in Scotland is you have two very different sort of playing outs of that Reformation. In England, you have the creation of the Church of England, which is obviously a response by Henry VIII to the fact that the Catholic Church will not let him divorce his wife. Um, and in the Church of England, you retain much of the structure, much of the liturgy, and to some extent, much of the beliefs of the Catholic Church. Whereas in Scotland, you get a much stricter adherence to the more radical end of Protestant Reformation, who the teachings of people like John Knox. Um, the religious, uh, the sort of both the religious and political and military history then of Scotland for centuries after this is inflected by this Reformation period, uh, by this sort of Reformation radical Protestantism, and particularly um, a fairly strict form of Calvinist theology. Um, but the, the wars such as the Bishop Wars, the Killing Times, and the various sort of disputes around the Kirk of Scotland um, become inflected by demonic discourse with, um, with military disputes and church disputes becoming a sort of feature of a war between a vengeful God and his great enemy, the devil, both directly intervening in human lives. So one of the sort of key features um, that you're finding in the Scottish theological discourse 
is um, an emphasis on spiritual discernment. Um, and this sort of has multiple different functions. Spiritual discernment in terms of rooting out false teachers and false prophets, getting rid of the, the false prophecies of, uh, within the Scottish context, often the, the Catholic Church, for example, or the false prophecies later on um, of the Episcopal model of uh, church management, um, getting rid of the false prophets who preach towards a more worldly church. Um, so the spiritual discernment to be used in uh, discerning um, sort of the, the orientation of particular causes and the orientation of particular theologies. There's also an emphasis on spiritual discernment in people's own private lives and internal religious life. This is a feature more broadly of Reformation Protestantism, this idea of personal inquiry rooting through um, your own soul, as it were, and finding um, both the stains and the blessings within it. Um, and we also find spiritual discernment becoming a key motif in stories about or depictions of the devil. And in all of these cases, spiritual discernment becomes a matter of life and death in either more literal or metaphorical ways. And by metaphorical, I mean kind of an issue of spiritual death. Now, if we're thinking about the demonic particularly, and we're thinking about spiritual discernment and how that informs our narratives of the demonic, there's an emphasis on being able to interpret stranger figures. Um, and by stranger, I just mean somebody that you don't know. Um, so the ability to interpret people, as it were, or slightly supernatural uh, figures and apparitions. Um, and there's three sort of key uh, ways that you might go around interpreting these figures. The first is through the appearance. So there are, as we'll discuss later, there are sometimes visual clues that you can look for. This isn't the same as that sort of Anglo-English Irish tradition where there's a true form to the demonic which will be revealed. Um, rather this is that there are certain signs that this body is demonically oriented. Um, that doesn't always help. It can be very difficult to tell within the Scottish de uh, demonic tradition because um, the devil manifests as people, as animals, as all sorts of different things. So um, a second way in which you can discern whether somebody is a de demonic entity or not is through their purpose in their actions. Uh, do their actions lead towards good? Do they, do they lead towards uh, sort of spiritual growth? Do they lead towards good actions? Do they lead towards the prospering of the, the true Kirk? Um, but again, that's not necessarily going to help you um, know whether it's a demonic figure or not, because the de devils can be used by God for his own purposes. They have not enough free will to escape from serving God's purposes. Um, and you see that in the Anglophone tradition, that the devil is punisher, but he's answering God's purposes, right? They're on the same side if they're punishing bad people. Um, and there's that sort of weird overlap. Um, so the last sort of way that you can discern um, whether somebody is a demonic agent is through their internal alignment. So the why of what they're doing and their emotional connection to their actions and purpose. So if they're you know, saving you from a rock fall but gurning at you the whole time, they might not be that angelic. So these are sort of some of the discourses about spiritual discernment within the wider discussion about how to tell if something is demonic, how to tell if something is anti-Christian. Um, but sort of in this tradition, although we have the influence of sort of, sort of folkloric tales and these ideas of the devil appearing as an animal, etc., what we don't get is that sort of um, narrativization of the demonic that we find in the English and Irish tradition, which is built on top of itself and become increasingly removed from the biblical kind of idea of the demonic. Instead, most reformed theologians warn against going beyond the bounds of scripture. And so the sort of key image surrounding the devil in the Scottish Diablery and Scottish Gothic is this very biblical one from Peter 5, 8, 1 Peter 5, 8, of your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The devil in the Scottish Gothic isn't looking for a special case, not looking to punish the guilty. The devil is looking for any fracture, any weakness of anyone prowling around, waiting to slip in, and we'll see later a little bit what those moments of weakness are, are meant to be, what they are. So I'm, I'm going to chat now a little bit about some Scottish Gothic examples, how the devil manifests in them and how we can tie it back to this broader 
sort of Scottish tradition. I'm going to be using books from the 18th, uh, so the 19th and 20th and 21st century here um, with some small examples. I've picked quite a few examples from James Hogg because this is sort of the start really of the Scottish Gothic tradition and um, keys us into some, uh, some sort of principal features. Now I'm aware that not that many people will have read all of these books, so I'll just give a, a brief little story summary as I introduce them. So we're going to be looking at Wandering Willie's Tale, which is the story of a man who is behind on his debts, but the day he goes to pay his debts, um, the laird dies. So he pays his debts, but gets no receipt for it and the money goes missing. It's been taken by a monkey. Yes. But anyway, he's sort of driven to desperation, wandering through the woods, drunk one night. He says, you know, I would go even to hell to get that receipt. And the devil's like, mm, really? Hello, <laughs> it's me. Um, and so Willie has to navigate this visit to what looks like the castle of the laird, but is actually a hellish space. Um, in the private memoirs and confessions of Robert Ringham, you have uh, a justified sinner, sorry, you have the character Robert Ringham, who belongs to a very extreme kind of uh, heretical sect of Calvinism, um, who believe in sort of antinomianism, the idea that um, there is a double election, you're either elected for salvation or damnation, and nothing you do affects that, so you can do anything. Um, and the day that he realizes his election is the day that the devil appears to him and leads him further and further down the path of theological error um, and into murder, rape and various other crimes. Uh, the Brownie of the Black Hags is the story of um, a very sort of ill light lady, wife of a laird, um, who is known for her cruelty to servants. After the death of one of the servants, a new servant appears and she becomes obsessed with this servant and hates them. But this servant is too tricksy. And it turns out that this servant is a demonic figure. And the last that we see of the lady is that she is following this demonic figure across the moors. Um, the fourth one I'm going to briefly look at is The Strange Letter from a Lunatic, which is by James Hogg. Um, and it's sort of framed as a letter written to James Hogg, which is a fairly common technique that he uses. Um, wherein a man tells about how he was walking one day in a park in Edinburgh, an old man offered him snuff. And when he took the snuff, the old man sort of winked to him. And ever since that point, there has been a double of himself that dogs his steps. Um, Thrawn and Janet were leaping forward in time to 1881, um, the writing of Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, Thrawn and Janet has uh, some really interesting features that we're going to look at in a second, but basically it's the story of a minister who starts a new ministry in a village parish. Um, he takes on Janet as a housekeeper who is a woman of ill repute in the neighbourhood. She is attacked because the, the neighbourhood is not happy with her being appointed uh, to the manse. Um, and she returns the next day with her neck thrown or twisted. Um, it later becomes apparent um, there's a demonic figure seen nearby um, and that same night, Janet hangs herself and it becomes apparent that Janet has been dead the whole time since that day she was attacked and has been inhabited by a demonic spirit. Um, the Ballad of Peckham Rye, we're moving into the 1960s. And here we're sort of moving away from the very heavily sort of theological commentary that we might be finding in the 19th century. But we're still uh, retaining these tropes and interests of the Scottish Gothic. In the Ballad of Peckham Rye, it's set in London. Uh, with a Scottish character, Douglas Dougal or Dougal Douglas, who uh, erupts into this sort of this factory life. Um, and his identity as a potential sort of demonic figure, he has little horns and everything, um, is questioned and he brings sort of sows disruption. And by the time he's left, there's been a murder, somebody's been abandoned at the altar, there's been adultery, there's been all sorts of things. Um, and the last one to mention is the Testament of Gideon Mack by James Robertson, which is a very uh, sort of active and knowing interaction with the private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner. Like private memoirs and confessions, it's a found manuscript, the found Testament of Gideon Mack, um, who is a uh, minister in the Church of Scotland, who is also an agnostic or doubter. And we have the sort of story of his life and interactions. And then how one day he fell down a gorge and he met the devil and communed with him for three days. Um, and the devil answers his questions and his doubts, sort of magnifying them. Um, but we also see how 
uh, the devil becomes a fairly sympathetic figure within this narrative. So those are the stories that I'm going to be using for examples, just to bear in mind. Okay, so what are the features of the de demonic in the Scottish Gothic? Well, firstly, um, and perhaps uh, sort of most importantly, the devil can appear at any time and to anyone. So the devil doesn't need to be summoned, although certain actions will sort of bring the devil running. Um, but he can appear literally anywhere in the world and he can appear at any time. It can, it's not necessarily, uh, he's not, he doesn't have to be summoned. And he's also appearing to anyone. So in Wandering Willie's Tale, he appears just in a wood to a working man. Now there is that sort of summons where Willie says something extraordinarily foolish. I'd go to hell for that receipt. And that's what sort of brings the devil, but it's not an incantation. It's the devil taking advantage of a momentary weakness. In the Confessions of a Justified Sinner, we have uh, sort of the emphasis on a, um, uh, a very religious man, but he's not really a special case. He believes himself to be a special case, but there's an inset narrative in Confessions of a Justified Sinner about the parish of Octomukti, who are also visited by a devil. And we realize that he's just one of many whose theological error has led him uh, to being sort of open to demonic interference. In the Brownie of the Black Hags, we have a switch. It's the lady of the manor in this case. So we have a sort of higher ranked person, but not particularly of interest theologically or in, in the faith. She's not a strong Christian that's being attacked. In Strange Letter of a Lunatic, it's just a man on a walk in a park. <laughs> There's nothing really important about him and the location isn't important. In Thrawn Janet, you have this despised outcast um, being targeted by uh, the demonic, but also you have the minister really as the target of uh, demonic activity. Um, the Ballad of Peckham Rye is a normal London factory life uh, with very normal lives uh, going on around it. So that aspect of normality and the commonplace is re-emphasized again and again. And the Testament of Gideon Mack, you have the devil appearing just at the bottom of gorge <laughs> and to a minister. So you can see that the people to whom the devil is appearing have all sorts of different social positionings, all sorts of positionings in regards to faith. Um, and the devil is taking advantage in each case of a moment of weakness, whether that's a moment of unlicensed consumption in the strange letter of a lunatic, whether it's um, a moment of spiritual pride in confessions of a justified sinner, or whether it's in a moment of doubt, such as the Testament of Gideon Mack. There's also, um, in terms of uh, how we understand what the devil looks like, that the devil as um, incorporeal spirits, angels and didn't, demons didn't have a natural appearance, according to Mother Hill. So there's not this true form. And we find the devil appearing in lots of different forms in each of these stories. In the Confessions of a Justified Sinner, he looks like a man. Um, and, but also in the story of Octomukti appears as a number of different crows. Um, in many of these, he appears as sort of an old man, a woman, a black man in Thrawn Janet. And we'll go back to that sort of idea of the racialized demonology going on. Um, so you have the devil appearing in multiple different, often anthropomorphic forms. But um, there is this emphasis on the imperfection of presentation in the devil. And here we're going to be getting into quite a lot of the sort of ableist and racist uh, narratives which tie in with demonic depiction. So from uh, 1664, you have Alexander Pitcairn, a minister, saying, there be some who affirm that Satan is so limited as to the manner of his appearance that he cannot assume the perfect shape of man. If we did observe and could discern all his wiles and designs, we might see so much deformity in him and so much crookedness in his best motions as might make us say, surely the finger of Satan is there. So there's this idea here of, though he has no particular shape, he cannot take a perfect human shape. There will always be something that potentially gives the demonic entity away. Now, as I've already mentioned, this is quite often very ableist and racist, and we'll look at that particularly in Thrawn Janet, but some of the signs that give away the devil are cloven hooves, clawed feet, um, he might be uh, a very common Scottish tradition. He might be uh, black. Um, he's also associated with ugliness and he might inhabit dead bodies. So in the Confessions of a Justified Sinner, this idea of the cloven hooves or clawed feet is explored in the inset tale of Octomukti, where this preacher appears in the very devout neighborhood of Octomukti, but he's leading people theologically astray. One man sort of sees through him 
and in the middle of a sermon lifts up his ceremonial robes and we see that he has the feet of a goat, uh, basically. So there's this sort of giveaway that can be found. In Thrawn and Janet, we have uh, sort of the intersection of some of these more troubling aspects um, of this idea of imperfection in inverted commas. So in Thrawn and Janet, um, Janet herself, as you can see, Thrawn means twisted in Scots, and we have uh, Janet being a woman who um, has this physical um, uh, problem. And the, the minister always interprets this as she suffered a palsy as a result of um, as a result of the attack that she suffered. But uh, what's actually happened is that this moment of the neck twisting is the moment in which she's entered by a demonic entity. We also have in this story um, the reason that the demonic figure that the minister sees when he's out and about is he sees a black man. And we looked at this uh, more particularly yesterday when we were looking at racialized demonizations. Um, he sees a black man and he's very suspicious, follows the black man through the woods um, and he just sort of disappears. And he realizes then at that point that there's been a demonic spirit in Janet and she uh, hangs herself and is second time dead. Um, now, there's obviously a less spiritual way of reading all of that, um, but this, these tie into sort of common demonic narratives within the Scottish Gothic. It's an interesting one for me, particularly with Thrawn Janet, because I have a condition which could very easily map onto that of Thrawn Janet, which is a spasmodic torticollis, which is when you can't control the movement or direction of your neck and people often get frozen in certain ways like that. So to me, it very much reads as that's what's gone wrong. Um, and so it's interesting that that is a sign of uh, the diabolic. Um, I've mentioned that you have this history uh, within the Scottish Gothic of the depiction of the devil as a black man. You, you can see that in the sort of the visual imagery of often in the sort of early modern period and not just in Scotland, but we also have it in the historical record in Scotland. So. Joyce Miller in Men in Black Appearances of the Devil in Early Modern uh, Witchcraft Discourse looks at uh, many of the witchcraft trial manuscripts and the descriptions of the appearance of the devil uh, that witches, in inverted commas, admit to seeing. So Isabel Smith, for example, described a black man dressed in green, Janet Morrison, a naked man with a black head and another black man who was rough and fierce, Margaret Jackson, a black man with a bluish band and white cuffs who wore hoggers but no shoes, so you have this as part of not only the literary tradition, not only the folkloric tradition, but actually sort of taking its place in the, within the legal history of Scotland. Um, the third sort of uh, key feature of the demonic as it appears within Scottish Gothic is the fact that the devil comes at a crossroads. This can be both literal um, and metaphorical, often metaphorical, that the devil appears at a critical moment. Now, this might be a critical moment as in something important is potentially about to happen or is happening, but it can also simply mean a critical moment is in a moment of weakness, a moment in which um, a person's life can be turned in one direction or another. So if we think about wondering Willie's tale, when Willie is wandering around the woods, this is a moment of weakness in that he says his foolish sentence, but it's also sort of a time of desperation, a time for the devil to worm into his life. And the Confessions of a Justified Sinner, Robert Ringham first sees the demonic figure Gil Martin on the day where he accepts wholeheartedly the antinomian teachings um, of his adopted father, real father, who, um, uh, birth father, sorry, um, who is, uh, has told him that he is one of the elect, he is one of the saved. Um, and that's the moment when the devil appears, when his theological error becomes to to some extent cemented and it opens him up to demonic influence. In the Brownie of the Black Hags, the devil appears in the moment of the dissolution of the family, but also the dissolution of the structures of power in the area. When the Laird has finally sort of realized uh, the character of his wife and is too weak to do anything about it. Um, in A Strange Letter of a Lunatic, it's almost completely random. This man is literally just walking in a park. What we get, though, is this becomes a pivotal moment in the breakdown of the sanity of the uh, protagonist. So we can only imagine that the devil potentially did appear in a moment already where this dissolution uh, was starting or occurring. 
In Throne Janet, um, we see the minister starting his new ministry and this becoming a point of demonic attack because of the, the strength of the ministry potentially, but also perhaps as a rebuke to his spiritual pride because we have the commentator being like, oh, he had a lot of book learning, but no practical religion. And he, but he was trying to write a book, which was awful prideful for such a young man. Um, in the Ballad of Pick and Rye, we have uh, the demonic agent as an agent of disruption, but we have him appearing at pivotal moments for various different characters. So one of the key examples is uh, in the sort of courting of two of the characters, and he disrupts their, their marriage and uh, the woman is left at the altar. Um, the Testament of Gideon Mack, the sort of crisis or crossroads is that of doubt, agnosticism or even atheism uh, with which Gideon Mack is struggling. Um, now, these are all fairly universal features of the demonic and the Scottish Gothic, but we also have some very common features. And one of the most common is the game of souls as defined by Douglas Gifford, um, where he says the devil must not actually lie to the protagonist. The protagonist must become his victim within a framework of truth. So here we're seeing um, sort of a, a ritualization of a particular mode of demonic um, activity. And it's drawing from uh, the biblical precedent found in Matthew 4, 1 to 11, which is the temptation of Jesus in the desert. Um, in the temptation of Jesus in the desert, what happens is that the devil uses scriptural passages out of context in order to draw Jesus into sin. So he says things like, it, is it not written that if you jumped from the top of this building, the angels would not allow a, ha a hair on your head to be harmed? It's true. But Jesus replies, well, it also says, do not test the Lord your God. So you are trying to use truth to draw me into sin. Um, so uh, one of the sort of main texts where this is explored in a great deal of detail is Confessions of a Justified Sinner. So this is a quick example here. Um, of how this works. So we have um, the, the character Gil Martin um, trying to chivy Robert Ringham into committing a crime, essentially. And he says, whatever thine hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, for none of us knows what a day may bring forth. That is, none of us knows what is preordained, but whatever is preordained we must do, and none of these things will be laid to our charge. So I've color coded it so that you can see the way in which each of these separate parts is drawing from biblical precedents, but the way in which they're combined changes and deforms their meaning and combines completely sort of uh, distinct contexts. So the, the red quote is a quote from Ecclesiastes 9.10, but the emphasis in the original is on this idea of man's life is fleeting um, and that we shouldn't waste time, we should act, but this is acting towards the good. Um, the, the green bit, this isn't a direct quote, but we can link it to sort of uh, biblical uh, texts like Mark 13, 32, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven. That in other words, God's plan is impossible to know. This particular quote is talking about the end times, but more generally, this idea of the ineffable plan or the inscrutable plan of the divine is unknown. Um, uh, the yellow quote um, refers back to sort of conceptions of predestination. So what is predestined or is preordained, therefore inescapable. Um, so I've just uh, used the quote there from Romans 8.30. It's a much longer quote is 8.30, but you've got a whom he did predestinate, he also called. So this kind of conception of predestination. Um, and in the blue, you have a reference back to substitutionary atonement. Um, the idea that Jesus effectively pays for our sins. As sin entered the world with Adam and infected everybody, so Jesus' salvation can cover everyone. And Christ once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, as you find in 1 Peter 3.18 or 1 Peter 3.18. Um, so you can see where all of these are drawn from, but the way in which they're combined changes their meanings or changes their context quite significantly. So Gil Martin makes it seem that whatever you're doing, good or bad, is what should be done as urgently as possible. We can't know what is preordained. And he uses this to suggest not that we don't know God's plan, but that even if something seems wrong, well, we don't know. We don't know uh, what we're meant to be doing. But because it's preordained, everything is preordained, we should just do it. Because if it's preordained, it will happen. And if it's not preordained, it won't. 
Um, and then he uses this conception of substitutionary atonement to fall into an antinomian conception. So instead of it being, you know, if you repent, um, if you cast your sins onto Jesus, then you will, you, there will be a sort of um, a substitutionary atonement occurring. Instead of that, it's, you know, nothing that you do matters. Do whatever you like. Do whatever you like because it's bound to happen anyway and you won't get blamed for it. That's what he ends up twisting all of these biblical passages to mean. And Robert Ringham is no Jesus in that he falls for it hook, line and sinker. Now, another common feature of the Gothic, um, uh, Scottish Gothic is the use and depiction of devilish doubles. We find it in uh, the Strange Letter of a Lunatic. We find it in Confessions of a Justified Sinner. And we're going to find it in the case study at the end of this talk, Markheim by Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, it's part of a wider interest and concern within the Scottish Gothic of problems of identification becoming problems of slippage. So if we cannot um, reliably identify the devil or a demonic force because it is so adjacent to the human, because it is so similar, then surely it becomes a question of how secure is that boundary between the human and the divine? Where does it actually lie? So that problem of identification of a demonic force becomes a problem of sort of slippage and overlap between the human and the divine. Um, now, this is part of the particular interest in this diabolical tradition um, in, in the relationship between the demonic and the human rather than a relationship between the demonic and divine. So if you think about that other tradition we looked at yesterday with these sexy Satans, the emphasis very much both in depiction and in narratives is often about the relationship of the demonic and the divine to each other with um, the demonic figure appearing as an archangel and blurring or as an angel and blurring the lines between demonic and divine. That's not a question when we're looking at a human shaped devil here. Instead, the lines between human and demonic are questioned. And demonic doubles are sort of this questioning um, pushed even further. Um, and if you have a demonic double, it creates a problem of identification, obviously, and it creates this question about the differentiation between demonic and human and the relationship of the demonic and human. But you're also getting into some theological territory. Um, it raises the question of human duality. And by this, I don't mean that mind body division, but rather the flesh and the soul, or rather the old self and the new self, the damned and the, um, the saved, if you will, the spiritual and the, the, the corrupt. So if we have um, a devil who appears like us is our double, and it points back towards our duality. Um, the fact that all men are corrupted, all people are corrupted, um, are sort of uh, infected by this original sin. So it takes us back to the doctrine of original sin, which is the idea that through Adam's sin, we are all sinful, um, and this idea of universal corruption. But as we're going to see, although this seems incredibly pessimistic, it also ties in potentially to a slightly more optimistic narrative. It introduces a real spiritual dimension to the use of the double um, as a feature. And in doing so, um, it, although it emphasizes these doctrines of universal and corruption and original sin, it also introduces, albeit implicitly, the flip side of that doctrine, the possibility of salvation, the possibility of redemption, which is the Christian flip side of that doctrine of original sin. Um, and I think you can see these things coming together somewhat in this strange letter from a lunatic, um, particularly these ideas of slippage and questioning of identity and this ne necessary kind of act, not only of discernment of the other, but acts of self-discernment. So um, the, the character James Beatman says, Sir, I'll let you know that I am not the devil, cried I in great wrath. And if you dare, sir, it shall be tried this moment and on this spot, who is the counterfeit? And who is the right James Beeman? You or I? At this point, the character doesn't even know if he's the real one yet or not. He has lost the ability to discern both the outward and the inward reality. So the last part of the class, I'm going to be talking about a specific example. I'm going to be producing a conundrum of identification. And hopefully you're going to be able to use the tools from the first part of this class
to make your own decision about who this figure, this stranger figure is that we're about to meet. Now, I don't have a particular answer. I know what I think, but there is no single answer to this question. So it's not a case of getting it wrong. It's very much like the process of spiritual discernment in real life, as it's understood within Scottish theology and Scottish Gothic, that um, you know there are lots and lots of clues, but you have to deploy spiritual discernment all the time because these riddles are not easy to answer. These are not easy questions. So um, Robert Watson gives us the options for how we can interpret the figure I'm about to talk about. It might be angel, demon or devil, or double. Now, I'm not going to differentiate here, particularly between demon and devil, uh, which is uh, broadly the distinction between demons and the devil. Um, but the way that these manifest in text is very, very similar. So I'm going to pop them into one category for us today. Um, and the story that we're going to talk about is Markheim from 1885, which is a precursor, I would argue, to the doubling that we find in Jekyll and Hyde. And um, I think can be really uh, sort of inform our understanding to some extent of Jekyll and Hyde and the spiritual undertones um, and Christian undertones that are, uh, I would say, they're not, they're not implicit in Jekyll and Hyde. They're very much there. There's quite a lot of biblical quotation in there. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about that um, and use it to think about Jekyll and Hyde is my recommendation. Um, it's also worth noting that Markheim borrows extensively from the Russian novel, Prestopini um, Nakazanya, or Crime and Punishment. Um, by uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky. Um, in terms of like actual scenes are basically taken bit for bit and there's an overlap in plot. So if Crime and Punishment is about a man who murders um, a, a money lender, Markheim is a story of a man who has obviously um, been in tough economic circumstance for a long time and has a habit of using a particular pawn shop to pawn what is probably stolen merchandise. Um, on this day, Christmas day, he goes to the shop tells a story about needing a present, um, but he has come with the intention of murdering the pawnbroker. Now, what he tries to do is ask questions of the pawnbroker to try and humanize the pawnbroker to himself, but to every question he asks, the response given is sarcastic, ironic, or um, quite sort of um, misanthropic. And so he uses these answers as an excuse behind his desire to murder the pawnbroker and he kills him. Now, at this point, he goes into the back of the shop, which is the house of the pawnbroker, to look for the gold. And that's where he meets an unidentified figure. The visitor smiled. You have long been a favourite of mine, he said, and I have long observed and often sought to help you. So when Markheim demands who this person is, this person who seems to know about what he's just done and has no kind of uh, inclination to report him, um, he, uh, he gets this response, which adds more ambiguity. This is a person who appears to know him, although he is unknown himself, a person who has been observing and who has sought to help, but in what way has he sought to help? How does this observation manifest? Who is this figure? Markheim has a very clear answer. He asks, what are you, the devil? So instantly he slips into the mode of interpretation of this is a potentially demonic figure, but is it? So we're going to have a look at the clues, think about what happens next. And then I'm also going to look at the clues that might point to a different form of identity. Um, so decoding the devil or decoding this figure in Markheim. The appearance, does this tie in with what we know of demonic depiction? Well, it appears in a shop, that's fine, it can appear anywhere, right? Appears to be broadly human, in keeping with many of these stories. He has a changing face, which is very in keeping with confessions of a justified sinner and, and that sort of paradigm. Um, and there's an emphasis on this idea that the creature had a strange air of the commonplace. So this emphasis on the banality and normality of this figure actually does, within the Scottish Gothic tradition, point us towards this as a potentially demonic figure. The fact of his face changing could be read as that sort of imperfection in presentation. Does he appear at a critical moment? Yes, he does. He appears at the first murder that Markheim has committed, which is another sort of step downward on his road to perdition. And the game of souls occurs. So after um, there's this meeting and this inquiry, the devil um, or the, the figure has this sort of lengthy discussion 
about who um, the, the, the murderer is, uh, his theological stance, and what he's going to do next. Um, so this is part of the discussion. This is the, the murderer himself, Mark Heim, crying, I have lied to, I have lived to belie my nature. All men do. All men are better than this disguise that grows about and stifles them. You see each dragged away by life, like one whom bravos have seized and muffled in a cloak. If they had their own control, if you could see their faces, they would be altogether different. They would shine out for heroes and saints. I am worse than most. Myself is more overlaid. My excuse is known to me and God. Now, as you can tell here, by the sort of uh, positioning, the, where the eye is coming from, the person in the game of souls who is twisting the truth and biblical conceptions isn't actually the stranger figure here. It is Markheim, who is using conceptions, for example, of um, uh, duality um, and of the imposition of the flesh, and of the idea that only God can judge, only God can know you, to excuse his increasingly um, iniquitous behaviour. So this is where we start to wonder about his designation of the figure as a devil, because what we get isn't the normal game of souls, it's an inverted one. So yes, the potentially demonic figure is familiar with scripture, which is exactly what we would expect of the devil. He uses scriptural quotations or ideas such as saying that all sins are murder, which refers back to James 2.10, which is if you have committed any sin, you have committed all of them. Um, and he also, it seems to be inciting Markheim to crime. He's, you know, saying, well, why don't you just murder the maid? Why don't you just do another murder? Why don't you just steal? So he seems to be demonically aligned, but it's Markheim who is the fallacious arguer. And the actual inter, sort of interpolations of this stranger figure push Markheim away from his fallacious and false arguments. And the stranger does this in a number of different ways. Firstly, he cuts through Markheim's casuistry and sophistry. Markheim cries out, you would propose to judge me by my acts, but can you not look within? So here he's referring to kind of uh, theological conceptions of faith and deeds and their relative importance in salvation. Um, and saying, you know, <laughs> looking at what I do, psh, that's not, that doesn't tell you whether I'm saved or not. That doesn't tell you about my soul. Um, but he's obviously, so the, the problem with his theology here, just in case you don't know, is the fact that although, yes, it's not deeds that lead to salvation, deeds are the outworking of an, an existent uh, salvation. So somebody who is saved will generally be understood to be acting in accordance as far as possible with righteousness um, and working towards perfection. Anyway, the devil or the figure replies, Ah, these points of consistency are beyond my province, and I care not in the least by what compulsion you may have been dragged away, so as you are, but carried in the right direction. So he goes through all this obfuscation that Markheim is using, saying, oh, you can't judge me by my acts. You say, well, okay, I don't really care about your arguments, though. What matters to me is the fact that you are starting to kill people. Great. So the stranger sort of places himself demonically here, but even though he's placing himself demonically, demonically he's using um, what he says to sort of cut through the lies rather than to replicate them. Um, he also uses the technique of showing the sort of logical conclusion of where Markheim's arguments is coming from. Because Markheim is saying, you know, well, I'm just going to do this and then I'll repent. I'll just do this murder and I'll repent of it. And they were saying, yes, well, why not just keep murdering? And then you can repent at the end, right? In your deathbed, that seems much more economical. Um, and so it pushes, therefore, Markheim to realise the logical conclusion of his form of argumentation, to which Markheim violently reacts. Says, do you think I have no more generous aspirations than to sin and sin and sin and at the last sneak into heaven? Well, the answer is, from how he's arguing, yeah, that does seem to be what he's doing. Um, so he's forced to face himself and to acknowledge his hypocrisy. But the devil asks, or the figure asks, this one very leading question. Are you in any one particular, however trifling, more difficult to please with your own conduct? Or do you go in all things with a looser rein? So he cuts through all of the bustle that Markheim is creating, all of the arguments, and makes him confront his own hypocrisy, that these arguments are just a front for... Um, giving him an excuse to do what he wants to do. 
At the end of this, so if we're thinking about the purpose and whether we can interpret by purpose, um, Markheim repents. So instead of sort of falling deeper into sin at the end of this inverse game of souls, he says, if my life be an ill thing, I can lay it down and gives himself up to the police. How we interpret that is perhaps another question. So um, let me just, before we sort of finish, give these other possibilities of interpretation or things that muddy the waters even further. So the, the figure appears to some extent as a double in Markheim. And there are three things that pop out from his initial description of the figure, mutability, familiarity, and doubling. So told that the outlines of the newcomer seem to change and waver like those of the idols in the wavering candlelight of the shop. At times he thought he knew him, and at times he thought he bore a likeness to himself. So there is an essence of doubling here, and if we mix that together with the mutability, if Robert, if Markheim is looking into his own face in this double, he essentially is seeing the, his own possibility of change, potentially. Um, and the sort of instability of the self as well. If we bring together the idea of familiarity and doubling, there's a sense that in looking at this figure, he's perhaps seeing something of his true self or being forced to confront the reality of his self, himself. Now, various critics like Irving Saposnik, Edgar Knowlton and Robert Watson have said that this is just a double. I, Irving Saposnik says that it's his conscience, Edgar Knowlton, um, that it's a schizophrenic hallucination, Robert Watson, that it's his other self given material form. And we can think about uh, the figure as a double, but I would say we shouldn't ignore the spiritual dimension, which is deliberately brought into the story by um, by uh, Mark Heim himself when he sort of identifies it as the double. And if we think of this not just simply as a double, but potentially as a devilish double, um, then we uh, sort of are confronted with um, some sort of extra readings. If this is a devilish double and he looks at this double and recognizes himself, then he's recognizing not only the duality that he already admits, but also his own leanings towards evil. Um, also, there is a potential, as we noted, sort of the coding of the devilish double by adding this spiritual dimension focuses on this kind of inheritance of sin, but also on the possibility of self salvation. So seeing himself in a devilish double offers the possibility of spiritual redemption. We could also potentially see this as an angelic double, in which case the possibility of spiritual redemption is even clearer. So could it be an angelic figure? Well, there is a problem with this in that James 1.13 suggests that God does not tempt anyone and uh, whatever the sort of success um, per, uh, and end point of the figure's arguments, he does seem to be tempting to uh, mark him into killing again. Just say, well, why don't you just kill the maid? Then nobody will know. Um, but we also have <clears throat> um, this figure uh, sort of on the flip side. Um, producing choices and, and um, focusing on both the importance of free will and of choices. Because Markheim has fallen into a discourse where he believes everything to be inevitable. And this figure comes in, reintroduces choice, reminds him of his ability to choose, um, and brings in sort of the power of possibility. There is a, a, a potential optimism to this tale, a spiritual optimism about the possibility of salvation. Um, tied to conceptions, not only the flip side of man's inherent evil is man's inherent goodness, the inheritance of being made in God's own image. Um, and there's also, if we, the flip side of the proximity to the demonic is the proximity to the divine, especially if we view this as a potentially angelic double. Now, this is the last thing I'm going to leave you with, and perhaps the biggest riddle in terms of interpreting who this figure is or was. Markheim, at the end of the discourse, steadily regarded his counsellor. He said, if I, am, if I be condemned to evil acts, if I am basically evil, he said, there is still one door of freedom open. I can cease from action. If my life be an ill thing, I can lay it down. Though I be, as you say truly, at the back of every small temptation, I can yet, by one decisive gesture, place myself beyond the reach of all. My love of good is damned to barrenness. It may, and let it be, but I have still my hatred of evil, and from that to your galling disappointment, you shall see that I can draw both energy and courage. So he's still placing the stranger here as a demonic figure and expecting the demonic figure to be disappointed by his apparent repentance, at least turning himself in. But the features of the visitor begin to undergo 
began to undergo a wonderful and lovely change. They brightened and softened with a tender triumph, and even as they brightened, faded and dislimmed. What's behind the stranger's change? There's lots of different possibilities of interpretation here. It could be a demonic triumph because is he pushing him towards redemption or is he pushing him towards self-elimination? It could be an angelic triumph, this sign that he has been forced to confront himself, confront his evil and essentially repent. Or it could be the melting away of the double, um, his externalized spiritual self. Um, and a reflection of his current state of soul as he decides to give himself up. But angel, devil, demon or double, your call guys, your call. <laughs>